Part 1, Chapter 1, First Memories My name is Earl Simmons. I was born December 18, 1970 in Mount Vernon, New York, the first and only child of Arnett Simmons and Joe Barker. I've always hated my first name because it always sounded so corny to me, and no, I don't have any middle names. Why my mother couldn't give me the names of some of the other men she dated, I don't know. There were certainly enough of them around. My mother found out she was pregnant with me when she was 19. It was bad because she already had a two-year-old, Bonita, and hadn't planned on having another baby. So she moved into this home for, for unwed mothers in Mount Vernon and asked her sister to take Bernita off her hands for a while because, of, because her nerves were shot. My sister ended up staying with her until way after I was born while my mother tried to get her life together. When I was one, my mother's mom died. And even though she didn't grow up with her, my mother lost the only person she felt like she could look to for help. Laverne wouldn't have taken both her, her kids. So my mother was forced to realize that she had to find a place of her own. Yonkers had more low-income housing than Mount Vernon, so that's where we went. We lived in a small, dark, one-bedroom apartment in a building called The Roker. My mother was on public assistance, and it was really hard for her to take care of us and pay, the, pay all the bills and the rent at the same time. I was also sick a lot as a child. I inherited a bunch of allergies from her and bronchial asthma from my father. My shit used to be real bad. I remember many scary nights waking up not being able to breathe. My mother used to have to take me to the emergency room and they would often end up keeping me overnight. Sometimes my asthma got so bad, they would keep me for a whole week and they never could find the right thing to do. One night, I had to go back to the hospital three different times because the drugs they were sending me home with kept making me sick. When Then the doctors would give me breathing treatments. I had to lie down in this crib-like bed that had a white net over it, and they would pump in this medicated air. You couldn't move or get out, and I remember being trapped in there, having to just breathe in and out for hours. In the spring and summer, I was under the net almost every week. I never knew if it helped or not. One time, I had such a bad asthma attack, my sister told me that my heart stopped beating and the paramedics had to take me out of, the, out of my house in one of those sit-up stretchers because I almost died. I don't remember that, but I do remember the day I got hit by a car. I was playing by myself in the street and found a dime. I was so excited. It was all silver and shiny. I immediately wanted to go to the store. But the problem was that I knew I had to cross Riverdale Avenue to get there. And that was a pretty major trip for a kid my age. But after a few seconds, I summoned up my courage and with a little burst of speed made it across and got to buy what I wanted, a lollipop and a Super Bowl. You know those balls that bounce all crazy and go in different directions? Yeah, I'm the man. It was on the way back that I caught it. The impact was so hard, I got knocked halfway up the street, all the way under a parked car. But for some reason, even though I was badly hurt, I didn't feel nothing. All I was thinking about was how my mother was going to whip my ass because I wasn't supposed to be outside. When I tried to get up, this white lady with a clipboard was standing over me. She must have been checking parking meters or something. Stay down, stay down, she kept yelling. Then other people walked by and they started screaming. I can imagine how folks must have felt to see a little boy pushed under a car like that, though. Everyone crowded around, and then somebody gave me a jacket to put under my head, and I just lay there. I just lay on the street until the ambulance came. Luckily, I didn't break anything, so I got better in a few weeks. But what hurt the most was when I found out later that I could have gotten some money for the, from the accident. See, not only had the driver run a red light, but he was also drunk. A month after the accident, an insurance company man had come to my house talking about a settlement, and my mother turned down $10,000. Thank you, but we don't need your money, sir, my mother told him. My family is Jehovah's Witness, and our faith teaches us to be self-sufficient. Huh? That was the loot that was supposed to be mine when I got older. The money I could have been straight with. Half of the kids in the ghetto get a little bit of money when they reach a certain age for something, that happened to them when they were younger. Why not me? And if the insurance company was offering $10,000, my mother could have held out and got a lot more too. Hitting a child, drunk driving, and running a red light? I didn't understand why Jehovah's Witness 
would have wanted to mess with my money. But the man obviously didn't wait for my mother to change her mind. Before that, I actually liked Jehovah's Witness as a kid. Ladies that my mother would get to babysit my ladies that my mother would get to babysit my sister and me would always take us to the different churches they went to. So I had experience with many kinds of religions growing up, but my mother says she liked the structure of Jehovah's Witness for us kids. And I always enjoyed it when she took us to the local kingdom hall for service. I remember the little gold books of Bible stories they gave out. And I used to read the Watchtower magazine a lot. In service, they often asked questions about the reading. And I remember one time I got up enough courage to raise my hand to answer one. The hall was mostly filled with adults that day, but the leader acknowledged me. Yes, the young brother right there, he said, walking up to me with the microphone. I don't remember the question, but whatever it was, I got it right. Excellent, young man. Excellent. That felt good. I used to like knowing the answers to shit. But every few months, my mother would take us to one of the conferences they used to have in this big stadium in upstate New York. And I didn't like that as much because I used to get embarrassed when everyone else got to buy food from the concession stands. And my mother and I had to eat the bag lunch we brought from home. Kids looked at us when we pulled out the sandwich with the bologna. That was like bringing lunch to school in a bag. It meant we were poor. I did used to like the traveling part of those trips, though. I can see clearly now the rain is gone. One family we sometimes rode with had a van. We would sit in front of their house before we left and open the van's doors so we could hear music off the radio. It's going to be a bright, bright, sunshiny day. It's crazy how different songs can bring you back to a certain, to a certain memory. The Spinners, I'll Be Around, reminds me of those days. My mom used to play that in the house on this old eight-track cassette deck that had had these big gray buttons. I remember the tapes only had four songs on each side, and I wanted to hear the Pointer Sisters or Shaka Khan all the time. My mother sang. People actually used to say she sounded like Shaka. At one point, she tried to start a singing career and joined this group. It was her, this woman Eileen, and these two other guys. They rehearsed at a club called Brown Eyes, right down the street from the Roker. When my mother couldn't afford a babysitter, she used to bring my sister and me with her, and we would just sit up on the speaker. I remember the music was so fucking loud. She was with the group for over a year, but after they did a talent show at the Apollo, someone asked them to go on tour, and that's when my mother dropped out. She told her partners that they'd have to find another singer because she didn't like the idea of shuttling her kids back and forth on the road. She never said anything to me about it, but I bet she probably regrets that decision to this day. My mom's used to be real nice looking. She had a pretty face, sexy smile, and a real attractive shape. And yeah, she had that walk too. When we were outside, dudes in the street used to always turn their heads to watch her go by. I used to hate that. I couldn't have been more than four years old when on the way to nursery school, I started to hear guys on the corner hollering at her. Hey, pretty lady, what's happening? My mother never answered them. She never looked their way. Ah, you so hateful. You so hateful, they used to yell. I didn't know what the word hateful meant, but I knew it was bad. I didn't want anybody to talk to my mother like that. And after the third or fourth time I heard them say that to her, I, sudden, I suddenly got the urge to kill each and every one of them. Every time we walked by them, I became more and more confident that I could do it. I could kill a grown man. All I had to do was jump on his back, choke him, and he'd be dead. Obviously, not understanding that he would have fucked me up at four years old. But I was sure I could do it. A couple of times, I actually did turn around with the mean face on. Don't call my mother hateful. Come on, boy, and shut your mouth, my mother would scold me. Then the guys would laugh and we'd keep walking. My mother never thought I meant anything by it. But I was dead serious. She was the one always explaining to me how I needed to take care of things. She was the one that told me I was the man of the house. So why wouldn't I have believed that it was my job to protect her? I should have realized then that my mother was going to be on some bullshit. See, if I was the man of the house, I sure had a lot of company. And whenever my mother's boyfriends would come over, I always had to go to the store in the morning for bread, eggs, and cornflakes. It was always bread, eggs, and cornflakes. The guys would have rarely been there for more than that night, but I guess they needed their breakfast. Of course, I never got what I wanted to eat. 
I want the cereal with the sugar in it already because we don't have sugar upstairs. But my mother didn't hear me and the guys didn't give a fuck. They got their pussy already. I remember my sister's father, Charlie Mack. He always wore this blue mechanics uniform that meant that he had a little bit of money because growing up in the projects, you knew that anyone you saw with a uniform on had a good job. Another dude was called Cookie. Can you imagine a nigga named Cookie? But he was all right. When he came over, he made the best homemade bread. It tasted so good. I wish I paid better attention to how he made it because he only ever used the ingredients that we had in the cabinets already. One Saturday morning for, before breakfast, Cookie actually walked with me to the store. And I remember thinking how rich he was because he had money to pay for the food. So I didn't have to use our food stamp. That was big. He scored even more points when he actually stayed the whole weekend. I thought maybe he really liked us. Then my hopes were dashed a few weeks later when I saw him outside on my way home. I was really happy to see him, thinking I could go over and ask him when he was coming to our apartment again to make some more bread. But when I walked over with this big smile on my face, he turned around and looked at me like he didn't even know me. I couldn't believe it. I had watched TV with this guy all day. We had hung out, gone to the store. To see a man that you thought you knew, that you thought liked you, then he doesn't even speak to you on the street, that hurt. If I was older, I probably would have tried to kill him too. Looking back, I didn't think my mother was too prepared to have kids. After me, she had two other sons, but they both died at birth. I was the only boy that she had, and I've always thought how unlucky I was because, man, did I catch it. My mother beat me for every man that did her wrong. For every man that fucked her and left her. And I know she beat me because I reminded her of my father. You ain't shit. You're just like your father, she would say to me over and over again. See, my mother and father were never close. That's why she didn't give me his last name. They met at Yonkers High School a year or two before I was born. And by the time I happened, by the time I happened, whatever relationship they had had been dead for a while. My father was a pretty cool cat in high school. He always had a lot of girlfriends. He was the kind of guy who got attention by doing something corny, like wearing a suit to school. And he was a good artist. That's probably why him and my mother got together. He was the man and she was a dime. But despite what most what must have looked like a winning combination to anyone in the neighborhood, they never clicked beyond just having sex. He was only 18 himself at the time, and he didn't want my mother to have me. After I was born... He never thought about living in the house with us. He never called me on my birthday or helped raise me at all. That made it hard on my mother, and she must have taken her frustration out on me because no matter what I did, I was always wrong. Bonita was a, was the perfect child, and I was the problem. My mother took a few judo classes too, so she was good with her hands, and whenever she got tired of beating me, she would just call another nigga over to whoop my ass. When I was five, the guy I was named after hit me with an extension cord. His name was Earl Scott. He was the only one in the house with us at the time, and me and my sister were bored, so I dripped hot candle wax on him while he was sleeping. When he got up, he just went crazy and started swinging on us. My mother did get mad at that one, but that was only because he hit Bonita with the cord as well, and her eye got real red and swollen. Another guy, Richie, was the mailman. And you better believe he delivered more than mail. My stomach would get butterflies every time he came over because I knew he loved to administrate the ass whipping, to administer the ass whippings. He would come in the house and my mother and him would go right in the bedroom. After they do whatever, then she would fill him in on everything my sister and I had done wrong. Even shit that happened two weeks before. I always ask my sister, why she got to tell him everything like that? And when he came out with the belt, I knew it was on. Stand up. Stand up, both of you. I hated the sound of his voice. Now bend over. He gave out a certain amount of hits per offense. It was like military style. Bonita, for not finishing the dishes, you get two hits. Earl, because you slammed the door and have been acting up, you get five. Bam, bam. If you moved, he'd start from one again. Bam, bam, bam. It was the worst. Bonita was always, always started crying, watching me get mine after her. But my mother always gave my sister a hug and, and told her to go to the bedroom. I remember my mother sending me away after Richie finished with me, too. 
I just don't remember the hug part. 